Uh, today's video is about relationships within populations or communities, or another way of putting it is relationships among living things in an ecosystem. Helping me out today is my mother, Julia. Hello. Do you have any sort of biology background, Mom? I took lots of science in college back in the day. Okay. <laughs> So she knows her stuff. Not that I remember any of it. <laughs> so anyway, um, now what really is going to drive any sort of relationship in an ecosystem is that there's only a certain amount of resources, right? Correct. In an ecosystem. Um, so, you know, resources, anything necessary for life. Um, now, what happens because there's only a limited amount of resources is competition. So when organisms need to use the same exact resource, they usually have to try to outcompete each other for that resource. Um, so anyway, now here's some examples. You know, the, the main example is a predator-prey relationship. This is probably the most common relationship we think of. Um, and predators, in a way, control the prey population because, well, why would you say that predators control the prey population? Well, because they'll avoid being where their predators are. Right, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that goes right into my second point. Uh, where prey basically live where they can stay safe from predators. Um, but we're going to look at both intraspecific and interspecific relationships. So we're looking at the prefixes here and what kind of separate the two words. So intra means within the same thing. Mm -hmm. So an intraspecific relationship means within the same species. So wolves hunting with each other, that's an intraspecific relationship. Or this picture of two mountain goats butting heads. Um, my mother and I talking right now about biology. We are of the same species. So that is an intraspecific relationship. Correct. Any questions about that? That's pretty straightforward, no, right? <laughs> now, interspecific relationship is a um, relationship between organisms of different species. So when a lion eats a zebra, chipmunk climbs a tree, or I have a bird sitting on a tree, because remember, a tree is a living thing. It's a different species. Mm -hmm. um, the way I remember intra versus inter is this. What do you call a system of computers that are on different networks? A system of computers on different networks? Yeah, you use it all the time. Oh, personal computers? Well, no, I mean, what do you log on to to get information from other computers on different networks? A website? Which is on the... <laughs> internet. Internet, thank you. I was getting internet. Yes. Oh, internet. Yeah, because they're on Sorry, separate networks. Sorry, I'm a little yeah. slow tonight. <laughs> You're connecting on separate networks. So Correct. since it's separate, that's inter. Correct. If you work, you know, you don't work at Warren, but, you know, we call it the system of computers right. connected the in the building as the intranet. I have that at my or you, work, yeah, too. Yeah, you, probably, you guys probably have a much bigger computer network yes, than I. We internet. do. Correct. So, yeah, the intranet is within, inter is outside. Correct. Um, so we're going to get into specific types of relationships now. Now, the ones that we're about to talk about all fall under this category called symbiosis. So symbiosis is sort of an umbrella, and we're going to talk about three examples of symbiosis. Um, so symbiosis is when organisms with two different species, they live in close association with each other, meaning they basically live with each other. It's not like a chance meeting of a wolf and a hare. Okay, that's not symbiosis. Symbiosis means these organisms are right there all the time. Kind of like when we have a dog. Sure, that is, I would consider that symbiosis, yeah, um, when you have a dog living in the house. So the first one, and they, we've talked about this one in class actually, is mutualism. What does it mean, what does the word mutual mean? It means you're on the same path or you're doing things together. Right, so mutualism is when both organisms benefit. So some examples, like a bee in a flower, because a bee gets a nectar, gets some food from the flower, the flower benefits also because it gets pollinated. Pollinated, yep. correct. Or the clownfish and the sea anemone. Or is it a men? No, I always say it wrong or spell it a wrong. Menemy, an enemy. It's an it's an anemone. An anemony, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, then the clownfish and the sea anemone, um, because the clownfish get shelter living in that sea anemone. Right. Now the sea anemone actually benefits because it actually eats the fecal matter of the clownfish, gets nutrients from it. Ew. Yeah, uh, but also um, there are small invertebrates that might otherwise try to get into the sea anemone and try to like, and that would cause damage oh, to it okay. that the clownfish feed upon. So it actually sort of attracts food for the clownfish while it's hiding out. So both organisms benefit, right? Correct. Now, when one organism gets harmed, we call that, and but the other one benefits, we call that parasitism. Um, so I have right there a flea, a leech, you know, lots of diseases are <laughs> parasites. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Um, 
So the key is, why do you think that, and I asked this to my students, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Why do you think a parasite doesn't want to kill its host? Because if it kills its host, then it doesn't have a place to live or feed. Right. And there's no more energy coming through the right. system that it can feed right. off of. So yeah, parasites generally don't try to kill the host. So they're living in close association because a lot of the times the parasites right. are living either inside the host or at least in cases of like the flea, they're living in the right. fur of the host. Um, but anyway, the final one is called commensalism. And that is when one organism benefits and the other uh, really isn't harmed or helped. It just kind of whatever. Right. You know, uh, here's a hermit crab with a sea anemone riding on its um, mm -hmm. shell. Mm -hmm. So the sea anemone benefits because it gets to move now, right? It's got a free ride. Yep. And the hermit crab, it doesn't really affect either way. Kind of reminds me, there was a book that oh, about I was <laughs> About the shell. About the... Yeah, he keeps adding things to his shell. Yeah. But doesn't the shell get too heavy or something? Even the shell gets too big, and then so he has to move to another shell. Yes. Yeah, I can't remember the name of The that. memories. <laughs> anyway, so that would be commensalism, I suppose. But actually, at that point, it was getting harmed. Well, no. Okay, no, we're, getting, we're going off on a tangent. It was a shell that got molted. Like, the original species had outgrown the shell. And then a new species went and habit, took habitat in the it's a ki It's a kid's shell. book. It's not meant to be taken too seriously, I guess. But anyway, so that's actually it. This is a short PowerPoint. That was it? Yeah. <laughs> It, did, were there anything, was there anything confusing to you at all in that? No. No? Okay. No, no questions? No. All right. Well, thank you for being my guest. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Uh, remember to do your checkpoint. Bye.